we're back in our Revelation study, and today we're going to be studying the church of Pergamum. And so the title of the message is Pergamum, the Compromising Church. So let's open up in prayer and we'll go before the Lord. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity just to gather together, to open up your word, and that you would just meet with us. Lord, we thank you for your grace. Your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your love. I pray that you open our minds and soften our hearts and uh, just speak to us, have what you would have for us, Lord. Help me to open my mouth to preach your word and to exalt Christ. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. So, I am an LSU fan through and through, and it's been that way all my life. Uh, I'm a fan when we got Joe Burrow, and he's throwing touchdown passes, and we're going 15 and 0. I'm a fan when Jaden Daniels is running wild and running up the scoreboard. I'm a fan when Les Miles is out there eating the grass and messing up the clock. And I'm a fan even after last night's game. That's not going to deter me. You know, in my heart and in my mind, LSU is the best team. They're the best team. We got the best fans. We got the best food. You're going to see that this afternoon. We have the most fun. We have, we have the best stadium. And like, those are just the facts. Like, that's not even a matter of opinion. Those are facts. Now, I'm going to stand firm on that. You know, I'm, I stand firm on that. And even after last night's game, like, you're not going to just see me all of a sudden putting on some Texas A&M shirt or some Ole Miss shirt. Like, I will not compromise on my convictions just because of some particular situation. You know, let me give you a real glimpse into my brain. So, After the 2012 LSU-Alabama National Championship game where LSU lost, it honestly took me about two or three weeks to even put on anything colored remotely red. I would just look at it in the closet, keep it moving, you know. It's a true story. I got a lot of problems. Pray for my wife. We're working on it. We're working on it. But I, I identify as an LSU fan through and through. And because of that, it affects, it, it changes things about me. It affects the way I live. It affects the way I see things. Like usually when LSU loses, we have been cheated by the referees from Vegas to Birmingham <laughs> down the line. It, it, it changes how I spend my time. Um, and there, there's a lot of crossovers from that to the Christian life. And the letter that we're going to look at this morning, Jesus, his, his words are going to give us insight into Christian living and the reason why we do that. And so... As we look at this church of Pergamum, we're going to see Jesus. He is going to commend this church for things they do well, and that he is going to rebuke them for areas that they fall short of the mark. And this, this message is going, to have, it's going to have a clear word for us as a church today. And that's this, that because of our identity in Christ, believers can remain faithful and resist the temptation to make compromises. We're going to see that because of our identity in Christ, that believers can remain faithful and resist the temptation to make compromises. So with that, we're going to be in Revelation. We're back in chapter 2, and we're going to be picking up in verse 12 of the church of Pergamum. So it reads, And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, The words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality." So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. So what do we see in this letter to this church? And what does it mean to us today? The first thing that we see is that believers are called to stand firm in our faith. And you see that right in verse 13. It opens up. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name, 
and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. And so it opens up, I know where you dwell. And in the famous words of the great Cajun theologian, Pastor Tim LaFleur, a text without context is a pretext for a proof text, and I've been practicing that all week. <laughs> so we'll open up. Where, you know, where is the Church of Pergamum? So or, you know, what is the Church of Pergamum? It's located in a city called Pergamum, and the city, it is diverse. It's diverse in culture. It's diverse in people. It's diverse in, in religion. Um, it's a city with a lot of money, and the people are very well educated. So in my mind, I picture a place like New York or San Francisco. And so in this city where they have all these religions and all these temples, there's one central religion, and it's the worship of the government itself. And Caesar, he is at the center of it. Like the emperor is at the center of this, gov- of this uh, religion. And so when Jesus says the words, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, it is a reference to all these different religions. And it's really not too different from today. Because our, in our world, we have all these different religions. But really, there's only one spirit that is behind all the religions of the world. And that's the spirit of Satan. And so as believers, we are called, we are called to stand firm in our faith, which is the one true faith in Jesus. Now, we're not rude about it, and we're not obnoxious about it. But at the same time, we don't like waffle in our beliefs, and we're not ashamed of them. In 1 Corinthians 16.13, it says this, Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Which when you look at it, be watchful means to be alert. To stand firm in the faith means to have a mature stability about you. And to act like men, to be strong, is to be courageous at a time when it's called for. And so Jesus, we see in this letter to Pergamum, he is commending this church for holding fast to his name. He is praising them for their faithfulness and for their standing firm. Now look, sometimes standing firm, it can cost you. And so in this letter that we're reading, it cost Antipas his life. You know, this church... They watched a faithful brother. Some of my commentaries said that it was potentially their pastor. They saw him lose his life because he didn't deny his faith. And so it's pretty intense. And so it got me thinking, you know, we got this pumpkin patch happening. And all the proceeds, they go to missionaries. And so we, it had me thinking about a specific missionary, Kareem and Sarah Mestar, who Kareem was actually here last week and got to speak to us. But so they're located in France. And their ministry has a unique gifting to reach out to people in the Muslim faith. And so he, it reaches people in France, in northern Africa, and also in the Middle East itself. They do it through a, a satellite television uh, program. And so those people that are converted to Christianity, like this story of Antipas would not be foreign to them because the risk and the threat of death is a real one for them. And so, you know, what does that mean for us here in Homa at Living Word Church? And so, you know, what, those believers that are converted, like they are our family members. We are, we are united together in Christ. Like those are, it's our family. And so we should, and at this church we do, we should have a regular rhythm of giving to them, of serving them. You know, we had a missionary, a missionary team just returned from Mexico uh, yesterday, and, and then we as believers, like we should have a regular rhythm in our, in our life of praying for the missionaries and praying for those converts, that they would have strength, that they would have wisdom, that they would have protection, that they would have provision, that they would be able to stand firm. They would be able to stand firm against persecution and against adversity. So in Philippians 1.27 it says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, side by side for the faith of the gospel. It's one mind and one spirit. And that's true for the, the people here in this church, that we would have one mind and one spirit. But that's really true for all believers, all true believers in Christ across the world. 
And we, we also got a taste of standing together in one mind and one spirit on our opening day of the pumpkin patch. We had the art in the patch. And so at the art in the patch, we had multiple churches from our community come and set up official booths representing their church. And we all partnered together with one spirit and one mind to stand up for righteousness, uh, giving the money to Hope Restored for the Pregnancy Crisis Center. And so you know, that, was, that was a display of us, one spirit, one mind on mission for the gospel. And we talked about the, the price that, for those converts that Kareem and Sarah are reaching out to. You know, well, what about us here in America? You know, for us here in America, the cost of standing firm, sometimes it can just, it can look a little different. It can just look a little less obvious. So here in America, you know, standing firm for your faith, sometimes it kind of just leaves you looking and feeling maybe like an outsider or maybe like the odd one. Maybe you're an outsider with your friends. Maybe you're an outsider with your family. You know, maybe you have feelings of feeling isolated. People might mischaracterize you as being like antiquated or old-fashioned or backwards or maybe even like as a bigot. And so here, here is the principle. Here's the principle. It is easier to stand firm when you have other people standing with you. It's, it's easier to stand firm when you have other people encouraging you. And so that is one of the reasons why at this church, we, we tell you it's so important to be faithfully committed to a Bible-believing church. That's why we, one of the reasons we put in church membership in the Growth Tracks class, why we say it's so important to be connected in a D group, connected in a life group, to have people that are standing with you, encouraging you. You know, Ecclesiastes 4.12 says, And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. And so God, He never intended any of us to do the Christian life alone. If you're not connected, you need to get connected. I encourage you. And so our call as believers is to stand firm in our faith. So the next logical question is, well, what is it that we stand firm on? And so the main things that we stand firm on are the primary issues, are the primary doctrines of the Christian faith. It's the central things, things like this. Jesus is the only way to heaven. There is only one God. Our God is Trinitarian. He's one God in three persons. The Father is, is fully God. The Holy Spirit is fully God. Jesus is fully God. Jesus is fully man. Jesus really lived a physical life. He really died a physical death, and He was really resurrected in His physical body. That people are inherently sinful from birth, that we are saved only by grace through faith, and that Jesus is really coming back one day in body, to judge the living and the dead. You know, that list, those are the big ticket items of the faith, and they really matter. You know, but what about, what about just regular day-to-day -day type things that Christians are called to stand firm on? You know, there are some things that are clear-cut as right and wrong, clearly defined as sinful. And there's other things that are like left up to matters of personal conviction, and so those things, they require careful thought and even wise counsel. So let me give you an example. So in my house, my wife Amy and I, we guard the content that comes through the television screen, through the cell phones, through the iPads, through the computers. We guard it pretty tight. Like Hollywood, the entertainment industry, and big tech, they have consistently shown us they are not your friend. They do not share your values. And Amy and I, like, we refuse to allow them to poison our children's minds and also our own. You know, we don't, we don't watch it. And, like, it might sound a little harsh, but, you know, we're not all that concerned with what our children's friends can watch or what games they can play. Like, Amy and I stand firm on our conviction, of our convictions. You know, when I was a kid, my kids, they don't always understand. They don't always understand. It's nice when they do. It's convenient when they do. But they don't always understand. And the truth is, that's okay. It's okay that they don't understand. Amy and I, we do understand, and we stand firm on it. 
when I was a kid, I didn't understand. I didn't understand why my parents monitored what we watched. I understand now, and I'm grateful that they did. And so this church, you know, I'm grateful that they stood firm. This, this church stood firm. They stood firm despite incredible external pressure. But unfortunately, what we're going to see next is that they compromise. They compromise within themselves from the inside. And we get a call that believers, we are called to resist the temptation to compromise. We pick up in verse 14 in our main text. It says, but I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. And so what we see is that apparently there's a, a group of people who have influenced the church to participate in sexual immorality and to idolatry. And in this, those two verses, we get introduced to three new characters, Balaam, Balak, and the Nicolaitans. So let's unpack them. We'll do the Nicolaitans first because they're easy. We don't know much about them. But Jesus lumped them in with Balaam and Balak, who we do know about. So we'll talk about them instead. So Balaam and Balak, it's a throwback to the book of Numbers. You can find them in chapters 22 through 25. It's, just, it's when the Israelites are walking in the wilderness. They're going from Egypt and they're headed to the promised land. Balak is the Moabite king. And when he sees Israel coming, he is scared of their size and he is scared of their strength. So he hires this prophet named Balaam to pronounce a curse over the nation of Israel. Now, he goes up on this mountain. Balaam goes up on this mountain three separate occasions to pronounce this curse over Israel. But all that can come out of his mouth is blessings over the nations. And so King Balak is infuriated because he's given this guy money to do this. And so Balaam, though, gives Balak advice on how to best attack the Israelites. And the advice he gives them is to set up camp next to them. And over time, what happens is the Israelite men begin making compromises and begin engaging in inappropriate romantic relationships with the Moabite women. And eventually it leads to them worshiping their gods and uh, participating in idolatry. And so this church in Pergamum, they are making very similar compromises within their community with the other religions and with the people in their area. Now, throughout the Bible, you get a few different pictures of the character of Satan. So in 1 Peter, Satan is described as a roaring lion looking to devour. When we opened up our, our main story, we see that our, this church, the church of Pergamum, it stood firm against that version of attack. It stood firm against persecution. They held fast. Another picture we get of Satan is from the Garden of Eden in chapter 3 of Genesis. And Satan is described as the serpent. And so the serpent, he is more crafty. He is cunning. He is shrewd. And the attack of compromise in the life of the believer and in the life of the church is more in line with the attack of the, of the serpent. And you think about Balaam. He could not, he was unsuccessful in pronouncing that curse over the nation. That's like a frontal lion attack. But what he what he was successful at was being clever and using his like ability to be cunning and shrewd. And it ultimately enticed the Israelites into compromising their sexual purity and to worship in idols. It's, it's like snake behavior. And so today, the attack of compromise it is still an effective attack by the enemy. And one of the reasons is because it typically happens slowly. It happens so slowly that you don't really realize that there's a big change. And so the two areas that are, you know, the biggest areas of compromise in the life of the believer, I would say is the same as this church in Pergamum. It's idolatry and it's sexual immorality. I think about the three like hot-button topics. It's sex, it's the idol of money, and it's the idol of self. And so when I think about it, it's like, what, what does that look like? 
Well, the idol of money could look like someone compromising their integrity or compromising their honesty when they maybe when they do their taxes or when they do their time card or just in general ethical like business practices. And so in an attempt to achieve financial success, they would rather honor the God of the bank account as opposed to being obedient and honoring the God of the Bible. When we think about Christian sexual ethics, we think about it being between one man and one woman in the confines of marriage. And the world's view has strayed a long ways away from that. And you don't really have to look too far and too hard to find other churches that are operating outside of those clearly defined boundary lines. And so there's a temptation for believers to compromise and also move those boundary lines, to move it to places like this. You know, what's wrong with living with, with someone outside of marriage? Like, hey, you test drive the car before you drive it. Like, what's the big deal? Hey, biblical views are old-fashioned. It is a new day. And it's really not that big of a deal that you're making it out to be. Or how about this one? Hey, these websites I go to, these videos I watch, these pictures I look at, like, it's not really cheating on my wife. It's harmless. I'm, it's just something I'm doing by myself. Like, it's really not that big of a deal. One of the commentaries I read, it had, it had two just powerful statements. It said this, Compromise always lowers the original standards that you once held important. Compromise always lowers the original standards that you once held important. And it also said, Compromise eventually leads you to accept what you once rejected and even thought repulsive. That compromise eventually leads you to accept what you once rejected and even thought repulsive. You know, Romans 12, 2, it's a call to us. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by, the testing, by, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. To not be conformed to this world, but to be transformed. And unfortunately, what we see in this church of Pergamum is that they had conformed to their world. They had conformed through these compromises. Well, let's not let that be true of us in this church. Let's not let that be true of us as believers. You know, we are called to stand firm in our faith, and we are called to resist compromise. Now, the next question is why? Like, why, why do we do this? And, and also, like, how? How do we do this? And you can answer both of those questions with the next point. We do the why and the how is because as believers, we have a new identity in Christ. You know, the simple fact that you know, throughout this sermon, I've been calling each one of us believers, it, is a, it signifies this new identity that we have. It's more than a label. It's at the core of your being. It's at the core of your being. It's your identity. In verse 17, in our main text, it says this, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. So it says, to the one who conquers. To the one who conquers. So who is it? Who is it that conquers? And if we want it to be us, like how do we go about doing this conquering? It's like, now that's kind of a loaded, it's kind of a loaded question. And the answer is a little bit of a mind bender. Because on one hand, nobody conquers. Nobody does that. But on the other hand, every believer is the conqueror. Every believer conquers. So the reason no one does it is because there's no amount of Christian work, Christian effort, a Christian stuff that you can do in order to become the conqueror. The reason every believer is the conqueror is because of the finished work of Jesus. It's, it's because of Christ. It's because of His finished work on the cross and in His resurrection. We get to walk in new victory because of Jesus. Like We have the victory. It is over. And we just walk in that victory. 
So Pastor Scott, he read it from Romans chapter 8. You know, the believer is the conqueror. In 837, it says the believer, really, it says is more than conquerors, which is like a super conqueror. And that is your and my identity as a Christian. And because of that identity, because of this identity as the conqueror, you get the hidden manna. You get the white stone with the new name. And so, well, what is that? Well, you got to know what manna is first. So manna is another throwback to the book of Numbers. Manna is the bread-like substance that God used to feed the Israelites when they were walking in the wilderness. And it's this language in the book of Revelation. It's a picturesque language. But in our main text, in verse 14, it said that the people were eating food sacrificed to idols. You know, they need to be eating on the bread of life that's found in Jesus through the Word. Jesus, He said it clearly. He said it in John. He said that He Himself is the bread of life. And in the life of the believer, Jesus is the one who lights your path, Jesus directs your steps, and Jesus empowers your life. It's His life. It's His power inside of you. And He primarily, reveal, he primarily reveals Himself to us in His Word. The revealed word of the Bible in the life of the believer is the hidden manna. And so here is the principle. It's real simple. If you are a believer, you should read your Bible. Like our God is alive. His word is alive. Jesus feeds his people and his word is the food that every believer needs. So it is one of the reasons why in this church we put such a high priority on expository preaching. You know, we believe that God's Word is the main spiritual diet that every believer needs. And so my wife was talking about in the announcement that we got this Live the Word conference coming up, re registration, November 1st. I encourage you, if you've never been to a conference, it's awesome. And this conference, we're going to unpack and we're really going to look at the power of the Bible, the power of God's Word, and why expository preaching is so, so valuable. Well, what about this white stone and the new name? So in, my, in the commentaries I studied, you know, they had different opinions on it. So one opinion was that it is like a sign of acquittal for someone on trial. So the white stone was like the sign of acquittal, and the black stone was the sign of a guilty verdict. Another one says that it's this ticket that gains admission for the individual to a feast or to a banquet. Another one says it's the symbol of victory that is awarded due to the believer's faith in Christ. And so really at the heart of it, what this white stone and what this new name really represents it's the new identity of the believer. It's an identity that you have in eternity, but it's also an identity that you have right now. So in the life of the believer, when you accepted Jesus as your Savior, you actually stepped into eternity in that moment. That is when eternity began. And you will just experience eternity more fully at a later date. You know, eternity heaven is being with Jesus. If you're a believer, Jesus is with you, and you'll just be more with him at a later date. And so, as a believer, you have this identity. Like you are the conqueror. You are the victor, and it's simply because of Jesus. Now, it had me thinking, okay, so if we have this identity simply because of Christ, what's up with the standing firm, and what's up with the resisting compromise? Why... It, it seems a little unnecessary. If Jesus did it all, why am I doing stuff? Like, what, what is the connection here? And so what I would tell you is, it made me think about the word love. So love is not something that you just simply say. Love is not just simply stated. But love is something that is displayed. It's something that you do. And so, like, I can tell my wife a thousand times that I love her. But, like, at some point, you need to show your love. like you, you need to display your love. So our words and our actions, they should complement one another. They go together. They want them to, you want them to go together. And so when I opened up this sermon, I was telling you about LSU, that I love LSU. Well, guess what? I buy the shirts. 
I wear the shirts. I stand firm on my conviction that we're the best. I'm not going to start pulling for AM. There's no compromises happening. I'm staying up way too late last night before I got to preach. I'm doing all of that. And why? Why? It's because I love LSU. You know, because it's because of my identity as an LSU fan. And when we think about standing firm in the Christian faith, we think about resisting the urge to compromise with the world. We don't do it to earn your identity. You do it because of your identity. So like, I don't watch the LSU game to be a fan. I am a fan. That's why I watch the game. And it's very much the same with our Christian life. It's because of our identity as Christians. It's because of our love for Jesus. And the reality is it's because of the power of Jesus inside of you. Like That is the real magic. That is the real thing. And so my identity as a believer or as a conqueror or as God's child, Pastor Ben talked about it earlier, it doesn't hinge. Like It is secure. It doesn't hinge on my ability to perform. It doesn't hinge on my ability to stand firm or resist temptation. Like It is secure. The picture I thought of is it's, it's like with my parents. So I didn't do anything to be in their family. I didn't do anything to earn their love. And there's nothing I can do to make my mom love me any less. And so, as a response to that reality, that I am her son, that I am loved, you know, I show my mom respect. I try and serve her. I try and do right by her. I, I love her. You know, I try and do, I give her honor. And it's not to earn something. I already have it. It's like I have it all. I do those things honoring, serving, loving, because that is the right response to the identity that I already have. Now think about how much God loves you. You know, my mom loves me a lot, but it doesn't compare to what God's love is for me or for you. I mean, when you think about it, He literally came out of heaven and died for you. That's radical. That's insane. You know, to our response as believers of standing firm in our faith, resisting the temptation to compromise with the world, it is a good and right response to God's love for each one of us. Now, you might be sitting there and thinking like, hey, that sounds good. You know, stand firm, resist the temptation to compromise. It sounds, it sounds good. And so it might be easy for you to say, but you don't know my situation. Like, you don't know what my life's like. You don't know where I'm at. You know, you don't know how hard my marriage is. You don't know what my kids are like. You don't know how hard it is to be a step parent. You know, you don't know how hard it is to be single. You don't know. You don't know what my place of work is like. You don't know what my boss is like. You don't know what my supervisor's like. You don't know the pressure that I'm under. And I would just tell you, you might be right. I don't, I don't know those things. But I know the one who does know. You know, I know someone who stood firm despite incredible pressure. He had pressure from, the, from crowds of people to operate outside of God's will and to take control by force. And he had the power to do it. He had pressure from religious leaders to shut up and sit down because they didn't like what he had to say and they didn't like what he stood for. He had pressure to run from the pain and the humiliation of the cross. You know, I know someone who had the opportunity to make compromises when he was in the wilderness with the devil. He could have taken the easy road out. He could have compromised when he was in the garden of Gethsemane and taken the easy way out the day before he went to the cross. And that's someone who's Jesus he says that He has gone before you. He says that He is currently with you and that He will sustain you. I mean, this word says that He will give you the hidden manna. He's the one that led the Israelites to the, to, to the promised land. He fed Elijah in the wilderness. He's the one that closed the lion's mouths for Daniel. He's the one that parted the Red Sea for Moses. He's the one that calmed the storm for the disciples. You know, is there anything that is too difficult for our God? In Psalms 17, David tells God, he calls out to him, he says, I call on you because I know you will answer me. I call on you because I know 
that you will answer me. That's what he's saying to God. And so the call to us as believers this morning is for us to be like David, to call out to God because we know that he will answer us. Our God is faithful and he loves you. And for each, each one of us in here, he has a plan for you and he has a purpose for your life. And there's nothing in this life that is too hard for him. And so maybe, though, you're here and you don't know Jesus. You know, you don't know this Jesus as personal as your personal Lord and Savior. So what I would tell you is that he is calling you this morning. So this letter to the church of Pergamum, like it's a Jesus is extending his grace and his mercy to them. He has not removed their lampstand. This letter is, is Jesus reaching out to them. And for us, for if you're a non-believer here today, that same call from Jesus is happening. He is reaching out to you. He's calling, calling for you to, ex- to accept His grace and to accept His mercy. He's right here right now with that same invitation. And so I encourage you, don't wait. Stop looking. It's the greatest decision you can make. Like today is the day to experience new life. Now I'm about to close in prayer. And if you're a non-believer, I would tell you to pray in your heart. Tell God that you recognize that He is Lord, that you recognize that He is the King, and that you recognize that you need a Savior. And He will do that. And if you do that, be bold. Come tell me, or tell one of our pastors, or tell one of the people in a black shirt, blue shirt, or even an orange shirt, because it's important. Fill out a card. It's important. We want to know what happened. Amen?